Okay, so here's tonight's class. Um, I, I just want to let you guys know that this is the third time I've shot the video. This one will work for sure. I've set it up on my wife's computer. My computer has been crashing. So I shot two videos today. I spent about two and a half hours shooting them and they both were lost. Uh, so here we go, third time through. I'll do my very best um, it, to, do, to do a good job. And, um, but a lot of power came through the second one. <laughs> So uh, I'm a little spent, it seems, it feels, but let so here we are. We're going to be in John, okay, and we're reading John chapter 5, verse 16. And you guys will recall that Jesus has been, he has just got done healing a man on the Sabbath, in, in, which you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. But not only that. Not only has he, has he healed a man on the Sabbath, but he told that man to take up his bed and walk. And that's against the law. That's against the Sabbath laws. So Jesus is intentionally placing himself in conflict with the religious leaders and the religious tradition of the day. And, and, and he knows that, it, that it, this is going to put him in real serious danger. The thing, what he's going to say next to the Jews is going to get him killed. He's, he's saying, he's equating himself with God, and he's calling God his father, and he's using terminology for himself that can only be used for God, and he knows this, and he knows that it's a death sentence, and, and he's doing it anyway, and so he's just got done doing that healing, and, and we're going to read the next section, and, and this section is loaded with spiritual truth and spiritual meaning. Um, and I want to just, I'm going to, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try my best to, to point it out as we read through it. I've never done that before, but um, with how much I've lost of the videos, I think it would be better if I, let me just stop at, at each scripture and comment on that at each point. And let me give you some background. The, this scripture, this set of scriptures is filled with Trinitarian understanding. And then I also think it's filled with insight that is deeply relevant to our spiritual lives. And what we're trying to build a contemplative community, a community of contemplatives, and we're modeling our spirituality off of Christ. It, we're, we're listening to his words, we're observing his behaviors, and we're absorbing him into ourselves so that we can be transformed into Christ. This is, this is what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Jesus holds all of the dimensions, right? You know, you, you, you've got Paul is one way and John is another way and Peter is another way. And I actually want to talk about Peter, John, and Paul at some point, um, their differences, which I, I think they're, when you read the, the whole New Testament, I think, um, and I know all the other disciples represent types also, but for me, uh, Peter, John, and Paul seem to stand out especially in a striking way in the ways in which they move in Christ and the ways in which they live and manifest Christ. And, and none of them has all of what Jesus has. So Jesus has everything. God has everything. And then Peter has what Peter has, and Paul has what Paul has, and John has what John has. And I think Peter, Paul, and John, there are others. We could talk about Doubting Thomas, and you know, there's all these different archetypes. But there are lessons in the way these disciples are, and in the mistakes they make. That They say certain things that look to be mistakes, and I think it can give us insight into... into maybe what our type is and maybe what some of the pitfalls might be uh, for us, um, depending on the type you are. So I think we could talk about that in the future, but so, so they each have their character, they each have their sort of, you know, flavor. And so here we are, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna read through this set of scriptures and 
and I'll comment as we go through, but we but we've got we've got Trinitarian understanding, and then we have the way in which Trinitarian relationship relates to our mysticism and the way in which it relates to how we move in the world. So let, let's see if we can do a little of that. Um, I hope I can give a good class. Take number three at 5.30 p.m. Let's see if we can do this. <clears throat> For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But when Jesus answered them, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. And there's no mistaking this. When, when we hear the language here, Jesus was using terms for himself that are reserved for God alone. And it was blasphemy, terrible blasphemy to do so. Some of the terms Jesus used were blasphemy to even say, even when you were not equating yourself as being that being. So Jesus is intentionally placing himself in conflict with the Jewish leaders. He knows they're going to reject him, but he's just got to tell the truth anyway, and that's what he's doing here. And he says, my father has been working until now, and I have been working. And that is a glimpse into the Trinity. So we know that we know that the Trinity is three persons, but one God. And if you haven't listened to the videos I made on the Trinity, go and listen to them. Listen to them several times and read the description below the video. There's, you know, I don't know, three or four paragraphs of information. You really want to get that Trinity in your heart and mind, because then when you read scriptures, you'll just see nothing but the Trinity all the way through it. And if you expand upon that, you'll start to see Trinity in your mystical experience and in your lived spiritual reality. So Trinity is everything to us. So he's telling you his, his experience in the Trinity. My father has been working in until now, and I have been working. And he's using that as a justification to work on the Sabbath. He's saying, look, the Father is working, so I'm working. But what does that mean in the Trinity? Since Jesus is God, fully God and fully human, what does that mean in the Trinity? And so, so we know that the Trinity is three persons and one God. We know that there have always been the three persons, that there was never a fraction of a moment when all three persons did not exist. We know that the Father did not make the Son or make the Holy Spirit. We know that the Father didn't make the Logos or the Holy Spirit, that they were always in existence, that, that, that the Trinity is the, the absolute foundation of the universe. It's that thing that came first before all things, and that the Trinity is, is the thing that was not made. Everything else in the universe was made, right? everything else, people and planets and stars and souls, and everything in the universe was made, was created, was given an identity, was, you know, blessed with existence, everything else in the universe, but the Trinity was not. Nothing made the Trinity. Nothing came before the Trinity. The Trinity has always been. So there's never been a time when all three persons did not exist, but, but within that reality, within that truth of eternal Trinitarian being, yet existence is conferred upon the Son and the Holy Spirit by the Father. So there's this one place of primacy, not in power, wisdom, love, consciousness. They all share the fullness of the Godhead. None of them are a little less God than the other. But within that infinity that has always been happening, what has always been happening is that the Father is the source of the other two persons. And that has always been happening. It's never not been there. So you just have to think of this swirling Trinitarian being 
that has never not been swirling. There was never a time where it was one and then became two and three. It's always three persons swirling. And yet, in that infinity, in that always, in that eternal now, the Father is conferring being on the Son and the Holy Spirit. It, but the Father is not greater save in primacy of place in that way. This is the best language we have for this reality. So Jesus says, my Father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he said that God was his Father, making himself equal to God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So within that Trinitarian relationship again, for the Father loves the Son. So now we know that it is love, and the love is the Holy Spirit. And so now we know that it is love. And, and tonight I want to talk about how that relates to our mystical experience, uh, to our experience with God in prayer and meditation, and obviously in the world too. But for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And, and so... So, this, so Jesus is saying, I am doing what my Father is doing. What my Father is being, I am being. And, and this is his mystical relationship to uh, the first person of the Trinity. Okay, um, so we'll, we'll read on. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And I, I, wanna, I wanna just stop on that, and I'd like, I'm gonna read it again, and I'd like you to hear this and faith in it. it believe this. Don't, don't allow your mind and your rigidity and your problems to make this not true. Don't roll your eyes to this. Let this be true. Let this be true. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. For the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. And going back just, for as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. And it, it is really important that you accept the truth that you have life in you that you have everlasting life flowing from the Trinity into your body and into your soul and into your mind and into your heart. And in it's, it's, we, we, 
you know, God is not like us. You know, the, the scriptures say so far above our thoughts are God's thoughts, you know? So we have all these notions of power and potency and purpose. We have all these notions and they're all wrong. You know, they're, they're, they're so far from the truth. And, and so when we, when we give ourselves to God and, you know, on this contemplative path, you know, the, the, the path of John, um, you know, when we do this, we, we are bound to get confused to some degree about how it unfolds because we have notions and ideas about what power is and what it would mean to be awake and, and, and what it would look like to begin to awaken. We have a lot of ideas about how that has to be or will be, and they're not necessarily God's ideas. And so we have to we have to make space and allow for God to begin to reveal itself to us. And, and we have this problem, right, which is the fall from grace and, and, and its result, which is a false self that we've developed. You know, we, <coughs> excuse me, we're raised by people that are broken and wounded. And, um, and we are, those of us that are parents are raising children uh, in a broken and wounded way. And so all of us, every one of us are, are raised in a broken and wounded world. And, and we, get, we get hurt, you know, we, we are betrayed by those who love us. We are rejected by those we love. Many of us experience abuse and abandonment and, and all, all of this, all of this hurts us so deeply. And, and, and much of this happens on levels we don't remember too, you know, just, it's just the way it is. We live in a harsh world. And so what, what happens is we, uh, as we're developing, we begin to construct a self. And, and a lot of that construction is in, in response to wounds and harms and hurts and love too. But we begin, we begin to construct a false self that, that is the, an enemy of God. In the end, it is an enemy of God. It, it's a false self, but we think it's who we are. We think it's us. It's not us, but we think it's us. And because of that, when, when God comes into our life, to the degree that we are uh, uh, associated as, to the degree that we think we are this false self, the truth and God and the light will seem like an enemy to us and will we'll be treated as an enemy and will be treated as um, a usurper and a destroyer and a, and, you know, an enemy of, of our will, as somebody who wants to take away our fun, right? As somebody who wants to control us, the way our parents control us or our friends control us, the way we control others. And so, so because we're, to, to whatever degree that we are thinking we are this false self, to that degree we'll, we'll tend to want to preserve it and protect it from the inevitable death that God must cause in that false self. And that's the dilemma of the spiritual path, that we come to God for healing. We, we come to God for healing, and, and God is bringing the healing, but the healing is, it's deeper than we thought it was. It runs more deeply. And it threatens things that we wanted to preserve and, and removes things we wanted to keep. And so we start to go get into this rebellious sort of relationship with God. And the Bible says humanity is in rebellion to God. And, you know, that, that can be said in a way that I think bothers me, you know, but, uh, but it is true. It is true. At the core, the problem between us and our relationship with God is rebellion. It is, and so and so and we and so we want to defend the false self, and I, I made a really great talk about this earlier. <laughs> I really, I was flowing with the Holy Spirit, and and it was so strong, and I it's just not coming back. Um, 
but I wanted, there's one thing that kept coming in that I thought I'd bring, you know, and say again, which is it, it, it's think of the ways in which you are in conflict with others. Think of how often you have to be right or how often you think you are right or how often you are right, but you must judge others in that rightness. um, Think of the harm it has caused to be so right. Think of the harm it causes to need to push your agenda on others, right? and, And we're not talking about when you're wrong here. We're talking about even when you are correct, this need to push it onto others is sinful. It's deeply sinful. It is the false self that must do this. And so, so, so even being right can be profoundly wrong when all of the context is taken into account. And, you know, but there's so many, you know, sins and, and if, you, if you're coming to the center for a while, you're beginning to see them. And, and it's okay if, you, you know, if you're new and you don't see a lot. It, it, my experience thus far is um, that most people don't gain a really deep level of insight into their disorder for a number of years. They want to, they're willing to see, but they just, they sit down and do inventory and they don't see so much. But then over time, you begin to see more and more. And this is, this is that everlasting life that is living in you and drawing you to itself. And so part of, the, part of the process of becoming awake and enlightened and loving and joyous and happy and free is dying and, and witnessing ugliness and coming up against our attachment to that ugliness, to that judgment, and to that self-righteousness, and to dogma, and all the things that we cling to for meaning in our lives that are false idols. And, you know, the Jews here are, are, are clinging to something we would find absurd, right? You, you, you can't even heal a person on Sunday. That sounds crazy to us. You can't tell a guy who just got healed to walk, <laughs> take up your bed and walk, you're you're healed now. He's supposed to wait till Monday to walk, right? Because it's the Sabbath. He can't take up his bed and walk. He could walk, but he couldn't take up his bed. So, so, and he's a beggar. It's all he's got. So Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. And and the, the dogma of the day is offended and you know, and, and there, here's this Jesus guy that hangs out with sinners and all these undesirables, these people that are low class and low education, in poverty. And here's this guy hanging out with those people. And we know you're not supposed to do any of that. We know that all of that is wrong. It, that, that dogma just arises to, to kill Christ. But, but we are the Jews in this story. We're not supposed to look at how they were at that time in history and say, wow, how could they have been so lost? I'm so glad I'm free. But no, no. We're supposed to see in what way am I in that dogma? In what way is my perspective on life, on how to live life, on the things to do and not to do, when to do them and not to do them? In what ways are those so dogmatic that they kill Christ, that they kill the love between us and others, right? That shut it down, shuts down any real connection. In what ways are these rigid, rigid judgments and, and, and dogmas that we hold? We didn't inherit them. We don't have them collectively. We each have our own. But in what ways are these dogmas killing Christ and keeping love from growing in our hearts towards humanity? And, and, and why are we holding them? What insecurities are these protecting, right? And, and remember, if you're, and I, this came so strong today, if you're right and you're judging, you are very, very wrong, even when you're right. And this, this would not stop dropping in to the point where I just belabored the point 
over and over in the in the second video, but it was lost. It, one maybe one of the better videos I've ever done, and it, I could feel that, and it was gone. That's okay. But but please hear this, everyone. You just because you're right doesn't mean you're right. You, you, you've got to open your heart to other ways of living and other ways of being. You've got to learn to let people be different. And 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 why? Well, well, one thing is because that hardness that you have towards others, you can't just shake that when you turn to God. That takes months and years to whittle away and be removed. So you're, you're, this hardness we're holding towards others is the same hardness that is keeping us from God. It's when you close your eyes, if you can't just spend time with the Trinity, just by, I mean, you could do it with your eyes open, but it, if you, if you, when you close your eyes, if you can't just spend time with the Trinity, why? What's going on in there? Where, what's that tension in your forehead? What's that countenance in your face, right? What is that hardness in your heart and that pit in your stomach? What is that? Because that is what's keeping you from noticing the Trinity already dwelling with you and loving you. What is that? And why would we want to continue to enforce it all day long and practice it all day long and strengthen it all day long and build those walls of judgment and self-righteousness? Why would we want to strengthen that? And then turn in at night and try to soften up and let down the walls and let down the dogma and absorb God, right? So we, we want this to become one thing. We want this to be one thing. And this rigidity out in the world it, that we've set up a lot of times to protect us from insecurity, this is death to the spiritual life. And on that note, also, there's dogma. And dogma was brought up to me today in a session with someone. And, and then here we have the Jews stuck in dogma and, and limiting the work of Christ and God in the world based on their dogmas that they're so sure are true. And you, you must know if you have paid attention to the world, if you just were maybe to just walk, you know, over a 20 mile or 30 mile stretch, maybe from east to west in Salt Lake City or, or traverse, you know, diagonally from east to west, you, you must know that you see people wearing certain clothes in certain areas. You, you can spot them, sometimes similar vehicles, similar clothes, similar interests, similar ideals about what life's about. And But as you traverse across the city, you enter into other sort of dogmas and ways of being and 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 they're vastly different and 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 it's all good you know we build these structures and institutions and all this really helps humanity but it's also all death it's also all death and so what i'm trying to say is however it is you're living don't think so highly of that Stop thinking so highly of how you live, uh, of your opinions, the things you value, the things you move through life with. Stop, don't think so rigidly about that. You, you must understand that Christ works through many different kinds of people in many different walks of life and they have vastly different perspectives from one another. And God is big enough to hold all of that. And we're the ones that get so small that we can't see that. And so we, we want to make sure that our dogmas are not, we don't canonize those because we need to die to those. Whatever our identity is today, it, it can't be that tomorrow or five years from now, not in a path that's on its way to union with God. It just won't survive. So, and, 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 and just as true, some of us that are broken, we don't know how to live. You know, we, we, we only know we were given bad examples by our parents. Some of us, you know, 
had it worse than others. You know, some of our members had it really terrible upbringings and basically almost everything not to do is all they were shown in some ways. And, but so, so we, we must not look to other people for how to live in a dogmatic way so much as we look to the Holy Spirit to lead us and teach us. And this is what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, I only do what I see the Father doing. The Father is working, so I am working, right? I, I know what the Father is teaching me. And, and so this is, this is the path for you. You give your life to God, God begins to diminish you. To, to break away all the lies and untruths that, that you have been living. And, and this is an act of love because it is to free you from the prison of mind and belief and rigidity and self-righteousness and greed and envy and fear and shame, guilt, lust. It, God is, is diminishing us in order to free us from this. And, 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 but we think we're the false self, so we think we're under attack, but we are not under attack. The false self is under attack. Problem is we've fallen in love with it and, you know, and it's gotten us to where we are. And it's all we've got, right? Or at least we think that's true. We have something much better under it, but we don't know that so well yet. So it, all we've got is this false self and we cling to it for survival but we must let it die. We must let it die. And, and the night is a, is a piece of that. But my understanding of it is it's really just the beginning. Dying to self, it, I think you die more to self after the night than in it. But the night is when you wrestle with God until you say, I give, I give, I give, I'll die. I'll do it. And that's hard to come by. Even the ability to say that sincerely is incredibly difficult. Not an easy thing to come to be able to say that sincerely in your heart. Okay, God, I give. I will give you my life. You tell me to go down, I'll go down. Anywhere you want me to be, I will do it. Just let me do your will and not my own. And sometimes that period of wrestling it can be painful because you're just up against it. You're just stuck with the fact that you want to do it your way. And not just that you want to because you're a pain, but you also know no other way. And the world is scary. And even though we're embedded in God, we don't notice that. And so we feel quite threatened in this world. And we just have some way that we've gone about doing things. And all of that has to go, but it's all we know. And so we defend it. We don't want to let it go, but we must. We must let it go. We must let it die. We must feel the burn and the pain of it and the shame or whatever comes up as we notice these ugly things about ourselves. We must be willing to admit we're wrong. And the quicker we can admit we're wrong, the better. But nevertheless, however long it takes, depending on how attached we are to something, we must be able to admit it. And, and, and that's, that's how this great love that is God could be seen by us as an enemy because it's, it's killing who we think we are and what we think has kept us safe and also just what we are comfortable with. But, but all of that is a lie and all of that is death and all of that is in rebellion against Christ. Okay, so we read a little more. I want to read scripture number 30. So, so it's, it's chapter 5, verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And I think this is one of the biggest keys that Jesus gives us into how to come to a place where we um, move and act right in the world. And, and, and this is a really tricky topic because there's so many ways to be. 
you know, one of the problems we have is that we, one of the benefits of humanity, one of the goods of humanity are, is structure and institution, you know, and tradition. Th these are good things a and they, they really are goods, but they are, but while being good, they're also limit limitations. And so w what we want is we want to find out how God wants to live through us today in our circumstances. You know, it's different for a married couple with kids than it is for a single person. There's, there's a different moving in the world for those two people. And it's, it's different for a single father than it is for a couple, right? It, 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 we all have, there's differences and, and we come from different backgrounds and we have different, you know, aptitudes and capacities. And there is no one way that you can say it has to look. It, 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 there is diversity in God. And so how are we to find how to move through the world as a spiritual being? How are we to discover that? Well, it, hopefully not by adding more ideas to our mind. I mean, it, it's good, especially to read spiritual materials on what it means to be a spiritual being. But, and that's all really good, especially the scriptures and then the saints, scriptures and then the saints. But, but in the end, all of that kind of has to be let go. It's absorbed, but then let go. And, and we've got to let the spirit live through us. And how can the spirit live through us? How can the spirit live through us if we have rigid ideas about the way things ought to be? or if we're copying our neighbors about how they ought to be, right? Keeping up with them or whatever. It, it can't be like that. So Jesus gives us this, this clue, this profound key for how to allow God's power into our lives. But it's a key we don't like the taste of necessarily because the key is my judgment is righteous because I only because I do not seek my own will. And so your will, what you want to do, what you think it all ought to be, that has to go. That has to go. It has to diminish and it has to get small because it's noisy and it's opinionated and it's self-righteous, and it's right, and it's degenerate, and it's sick, and it's twisted, it's addictive, right? It, 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 our will, no matter where it falls on the spectrum, is false. And, and if, if it's God's will, just, this is just, a, just made up, you know, if it's God's will that I mow the lawn today, And I mow that lawn out of self-will. There is no spiritual benefit. There is none. I'm out there mowing the lawn. The physical act is being done. But what God wants is this relationship, right, of love. And if I am doing my will and I'm not doing God's will, then that relationship of love isn't there. And conversely, just as true, is that um, a person could be wanting to do God's will and take an action that isn't God's will, but they think it is, and that brings more life and light into their life than doing the right thing for the wrong reason. And why, How could that be? Well, because it's about grace and love, right? It's about relationship with God. Which is more sinful? To do the right thing but not know that because you've said, no, I'm gonna do what I want today. This is my day. That's more sinful by far than the person who does the wrong thing, but really believes it's what God wanted for them, right? I mean, within reason, because we can go nuts, but just look inside, in the person, in their heart, which one of those two people is open to God? Which one of those people is open to God, right? Now, we want accuracy and, and you know, we, we want to do our best in the world. We're not saying delusion is good. We're not saying you can't go nuts down this other road. But the point is that it's our will that needs to be surrendered 
and given up on. And it's, it's through that, not today, not, not like I give up my will, now should I go to Lagoon? Not like that so much. I mean, that's okay. But as a, as a, a movement of the soul over time, to more and more deeply surrender one's will completely and to come to a place where you don't have much of a desire going on in a lot of areas. And in that silence, you find yourself, I'm not even gonna say doing the right things. I mean, of course we wanna do the right things and it really matters to us, but it's not that. In that silence and surrender of all this ego and self-righteousness and self-importance is a growing love and um, peace and connection with, with God. The thing that fulfills everything, right? That makes a walk in the backyard more spiritually beneficial than three miles of walking in the forest, right? Without it, without that connection that makes five minutes with someone you love more important and impactful than five hours with them when you're not connected. It's all about this relationship with God. And okay, so I think, I think that's all I can say. I, I did give a much better talk earlier. This is the best I can do for now. But I, wanna, I just want to say something about the Trinity now. I'm kind of hammering away at this, and there's a reason why I am, and I think I've said it in a number of videos, and I know I have, but there's a reason I'm doing it. So, so just think now, okay? If you close your eyes, you're looking out into infinity. It is vast and open. But oftentimes we don't notice that. Most times we don't notice that because of all the heavy, thick, dense thinking and feeling and willing, our desires and our aversions, you know, all that stuff is making all this noise in there and it builds up these walls to where our mind and consciousness feels very small. You know, we close our eyes, it doesn't feel cosmic. It doesn't feel like it goes on and on and on for a thousand miles, right? It doesn't feel like that. It feels like you're surrounded and alone and in this small space. And those are the obscurations that keep you from noticing God. And so, so Jesus has this Trinitarian consciousness that he's always revealing to us. But, but we have a Trinitarian consciousness also. How could our mystical experience not be Trinitarian? It must be. It must be Trinitarian. There's nothing else. So let's just say for a moment that you did sort of close your eyes and you, and you weren't going to meditate. You know, you weren't going to go into the void. You were going to practice the presence of God. So you're you're remaining very conscious, but you are also at the same time dropping all ideas and notions and thoughts and feelings and desires and, and, and just really honing down on being still. And, and then let's just say for a moment that, that, that it got quiet for you and that all that eased up and it lightened up and, and it opened up and all of a sudden you found yourself in this great spaciousness, right? This openness. And let's say that was a profound um, quieting, not a forced one, which is another kind of noise, right? That effort is noise. So that's it's another kind of block and resistance, but let's just say it really opened. Then what, what what a Christian mystic might experience in that is um, an, an awareness of God being, <laughs> right? Like it's quiet enough now to notice that God is being. And you notice God being 
in there. And then it, you, you notice that it is, even though it doesn't have fingers and toes, that this, this being that is being in there is being with you. And all of a sudden you notice that there is a personal, a profound, profoundly deep personal connection there. And in noticing that is a love that bursts open in your heart. That is a Trinitarian experience. If the Father is pure being and, and the Son is the Logos, the consciousness, and the Holy Spirit is love, then when you close your eyes and you experience this relationship, this connection with God through love, this personal, deeply personal, loving connection where you notice God really is there. And notice we're not talking about blinding white light. Notice we're not talking about having been rocketed out of your body into another dimension. Notice we're not talking about having moved forward into some other place, but right where you sit right now, there dwells the Trinity. right there where you sit with nowhere to go with nothing you must do first there dwells the trinity In. And that being is knowing you with a hundred percent of its attention and love. And it is drawing you into a place where you can return that attention and love. But it's already there. Okay, thank you all very much. Super quick announcements. Uh, I'm really down on time here to get this up for you guys by 6.45. Um, so I have to make these announcements very quick. Uh, we won't make it into the center this winter. The COVID virus is spreading. I um, mean, Utah is really strong right now. We will get together, so don't worry. Let's hold this community together. Let's redouble our efforts, especially in the areas of prayer and meditation. Let's redouble our commitment to our spirituality and to one another. And let's remain a vibrant community who gets more out of this virus, not less. More out of this inconvenience, not less. Okay, so there's that. And then um, I think that's, there was one other, I think that's all. Okay, so, and then what just, you know, um, I started, I'm releasing shorter videos. I can't guarantee a video a day. There's no way. But I might be able to shoot for four or five a week. That's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Let's see if I stick with that. I can't guarantee that. But that's my, my aim. Shorter videos you could watch on the way to work, maybe in the morning, uh, or winding down on the way home, 
you know, before you have other things you want to do and you want to let go of work. Um, shorter, maybe a, a scripture that isn't in John and a, and a shorter commentary on that. That's my goal is to really some shorter ones, but to get a lot of the diversity we're not getting out of just staying in John most of the time. Um, and that's all um, I want to just with, want to say about donations, just they, they're a little down again. And, and, and just please don't forget and please be generous. And I'm very grateful to you for that. And that, and that's it. Uh, look for an email on Friday. It might be cold tomorrow. We may be canceling band. So look for an email in case that happens. Just consider us. We're doing band unless you get an email saying we're not. And thank you all very much. And I'll see you on Zoom this evening. Um, uh, we should go to 8.15 um, at the latest for Zoom. Just so you know, that, that should be the time in which we shut it down. Okay. <laughs>